What's up, friends and family? There are a number of movements going on around the world that we should be paying attention to. Most people in North America have no idea what's going on in other places. But some of you are watching. Some of you know what I'm talking about already. I want to talk about rebellion, a global rebellion, one that's going on right now under our noses. We could be part of it, but you're at the mall. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. To look at all the various uprisings taking place around the world right now, you might not see much that unites them. But actually, every reason the movements have given for coming together and rising up can be traced back to capitalism and the state. I'd like to look really briefly at a few, not all, of these movements with you and see what we can learn from them. One of the first things you learn is each uprising has more than one cause, and to impute all the participants' rage to one measure that the government might have just recently taken is misleading. In Iran, for example, that's where we're going to start, um, there was a hike in the price of gas. Now, surely, if Iran had a strong economy and low inflation, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But in Iran, like everywhere else, by the way, the economy is owned by a small number of people at the top. They reap all the rewards of the economy. And it's everyone else who has to pay. And when you look at the state's response to the protests, like beating, jailing, killing people, and turning off the internet, well, I'd be pretty pissed too. With all these revolts I don't that, that I'm going to talk about today, I don't claim to have like a lot of knowledge on the subject. After all, I'm not there. So of course, please correct me in the comments uh, if, if about any of the stuff I'm going to say if you know better. But uh, if the Iranian government and the independent are to be believed, well, the independent it says at least 200,000 people, I'm guessing more than 200,000, took part in the protests, and a bunch of banks have been burned. If you look down here, it says, in a televised briefing, uh, the uh, interior minister claimed protesters attacked more than 50 military and police barracks and outposts, 183 police vehicles, 731 banks, 70 petroleum stations, uh, nine religious sites. I don't know if they really did that or not, or why. Again, I'm not an expert here. But that's okay. All I need to do is tell you about them. They're burning down banks in Iran. Why? Because they know who the real enemy is. They know Iran's ruling elite own banks, petrochemical companies, and so on. So they're attacking them where they hurt. Meanwhile, in North America, consumers are going out this weekend to buy stuff. That's going to make their rulers stronger. Then they're going to go home and watch things burning in other countries and say, well, that's over there where they've got real problems. They don't live under a government, they live under a regime. They don't have news media, they have propaganda. Totally different from us, right? Something similar is happening in Chile. Sure, it may have started because of a rise in transportation fees, but really that was just the spark that lit the powder keg. You'll probably hear the word neoliberalism when talking about Chile, but if you don't know what that means, don't worry, it's really just the latest iteration of capitalism. Contrary to the beliefs of the Chicago School economists who implemented Chile's economic policies, 
plus a million armchair economists in North America, the people of Chile are not free and rich yet. And there's no sign they're going in that direction. They're fighting the extreme inequality and oppression that are inherent to any form of capitalism. One big difference between them and people in North America is they understand their situation on a systemic level much better than Americans, who are so afraid of words like socialism and anarchy, so afraid to let go of their marginal levels of prosperity. They're willing to overlook pretty much anything that their rulers do to them, or for that matter, do to people abroad. They think letting part of the state impeach one person is some kind of solution to something. Any anger or frustration they feel is channeled into satire, so they can laugh at late-night talk shows and then go back to work in the morning. In Bolivia, the people are fighting against a coup supported by the U.S. and led by fascists, white settlers who think they should own a country that's mostly indigenous people. The new government is composed of people who would gladly open the country up to international mining companies and, of course, the environmental destruction that comes with that. Indigenous people are fighting a settler colonial regime. Oh, and um, they're doing that in North America, too. Like, think Standing Rock. Think Trans Mountain Pipeline. The people everywhere are violently opposed to the continuing march of capitalism. Do they have your support? In Ecuador, indigenous people plus students and unions have been leading major demonstrations against austerity. They pretty much paralyzed the whole country, blocking roadways and eventually taking over the presidential palace in Quito. Now, if you think these kinds of measures are extreme or violent and therefore unjustified, please bear in mind they are pretty much the only way to stop the state from doing anything it wants. The ideal would be to eliminate the state so that they don't need to fight it forever into the future. But at least they forced it to back down for the time being. In Iraq, the people are fighting to clean up the mess the U.S. and its allies left behind after their invasion of 2003. After all the shit they've taken, they're still fighting for their freedom and their lives. The economy sucks, and the state just takes from them and beats them up. You may have noticed those are pretty common themes. But hey, are things really that different from in the U.S.? Look at what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. It was triggered when people who aren't exactly prospering economically, and who never have under capitalism, demanded the police stop killing them, and demanded that the rest of us listen to them. Or Standing Rock, where a big corporation was pushing its way into indigenous land, and they were fighting to stop it. They were beaten, and sprayed, and arrested, and jailed. And the pipeline got built, and it leaked, just like they said it would. Then you've got Hong Kong. It would be quite the stretch to say the protests in Hong Kong are essentially anti-capitalist. There are leftists among them, but I don't know how influential they are. However, they are fighting against the influence of an authoritarian capitalist state, China. There are people on the left and the right who won't understand this, but China is not socialist, and it's not even close to communist. China is as capitalist as anywhere else. But at least as importantly, it's really authoritarian, which might be great for tankies, but for the rest of us, it's a good reason to fight back. They're not just fighting against the extradition of one guy. They're fighting a law and a whole system that could lead to the same oppression people on the mainland have to live with. Hong Kongers don't want to be imprisoned or tortured for criticizing the government. 
Leftists who denigrate the protests in Hong Kong and paint all of them with the brush of imperialist conspiracy against China based on a couple of photos and some money from an American NGO are not convincing in the light of the recent elections that prove the movement has considerable support among voters. I'll fight anyone supporting oppression, as long as they're not fighting to become the oppressors themselves. Haiti, Puerto Rico, Egypt, Sudan, Algeria, Lebanon, and probably a dozen other places have also been rocking under major demonstrations, some carrying on for months or even years. They all have varying immediate causes, they are having varying amounts of success, but they're united in their opposition to the ruling elite. But hey, if those places are too far away and too different for North Americans, then look at what's happening in France. In France, the Gilets Jaunes, or Yellow Vests, have been protesting for a year. They've attacked banks and luxury stores, blocked roads, and clashed with police, of course. To be clear, this is not a purely left-wing movement. It's okay not to support every element of every social movement. But at least they're weaponizing the people's grievances against the wealthy and the political class. The state has offered what it calls reform, but it's not enough. So they're still in the streets, fighting for justice, not just promises. Either way, we know the protests have the chance of winning because of how severe the police have been cracking down on them. The police have come out in full force, using tear gas, rubber bullets, water cannons, flash grenades, and even explosive grenades. See, when you hold a peaceful protest, you don't get attacked, because you're not a threat to anything. When you hold an effective protest, the police move in. And that's been going on for more than a year now. Just this weekend, there have been protests in France and strikes in Germany against Amazon. Okay, so the ideal would be to take over Amazon and run it cooperatively, or even to destroy the whole company. But that's not easy. At least people are doing something that could have some effect. Most people in North America have no idea what's going on. I think the reason Americans and Canadians are not listening and not attempting similar scale protests is they're so thoroughly indoctrinated they can't understand the system and how it enslaves them. They don't know how capitalism and the state work. They don't understand the role of the police. They don't know there are alternatives to following the law and paying taxes and working 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I really think indoctrination is the main reason for all this, as it was certainly my reason for not understanding and not, not really caring about any of these things. But some have pointed out that people in North America also benefit the most from this global capitalist system as their silence and complicity is bought with cheap raw materials and imports from the rest of the world. But that's why revolt in these places is so important. It would weaken the entire system worldwide. For example, if Americans rose up in great numbers, the state would have to be fighting them at home, so it would have fewer resources to send weapons or, or hold battalions to other states so they can suppress local revolts. We could be cooperating across borders, sending whatever kind of support to people who are ready to fight. Not everyone has to be in the streets, as there are lots of ways that you can support the revolution. Strategy and vision are important. That takes analysis of your situation, and some knowledge of how movements like yours have fared in the past. Having a decentralized movement is important. If you arrest a group's leader, the whole thing could fall apart. So don't have one leader. Everyone should be empowered to be the leader or to operate independently. 
And don't let the police drag people away one by one, because that's what they'll try to do. Again, more knowledge of the history of these other movements and how they operate would be super useful. Finally, we should be attacking the source of our problems, like banks, government buildings, large corporations, the police. Not symptoms of our problems, like individual policies or immigrants and refugees. We should be fighting alongside our contemporaries in other countries for freedom and justice. We should have all the same grievances as them. But we're not going to change anything at the mall.